Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and in partnership with Miami Book Fair and our indie bookstore friends, Gibson's in Concord, New Hampshire, the King's English in Salt Lake City, Utah, Left Bank Books in St. Louis, Missouri, and University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington. It's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Jane McGonigal to discuss Imaginable, how to see the future coming and feel ready for anything, even things that seem impossible today, published by our friends at Spiegel and Graf. Jane McGonigal is a future forecaster and designer of reality games created to improve real lives and solve real problems. She is also the author of two New York Times bestselling books, Reality is Broken, Why Games Make Us Better and How They Can Change the World, and Super Better, The Power of Living Gamefully. Her TED Talks on how gaming can improve our lives have more than 15 million views. She is also the Director of Games Research and Development at the Institute for the Future, a nonprofit research group in Palo Alto, California, and she currently teaches the course How to Think Like a Futurist at Stanford University and is the lead instructor for the Institute for the Future's series on the Coursera platform. To moderate tonight's conversation, we are also joined by Charles Duig, who is a Pulitzer Prize journalist and the author of The Power of Habit, which has spent over three years on bestseller lists and has been translated into 40 languages, and Smarter, Faster, Better, also a bestseller. Mr. Duig has writes for the New Yorker magazine and is a graduate of Yale University and the Harvard Business School. He has been a frequent contributor to CNBC, This American Life, NPR, The Colbert Report, PBS's News Hour and Frontline. He was also, for one terrifying day, 1999, a bike messenger in San Francisco. Throughout this evening's broadcast, you're invited to ask questions by using the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of your screen. And please order your copy of Imaginable from Books and Books or any of our indie bookstore friends by pressing the green button below. We appreciate each and every order and the generous donations from viewers everywhere. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guests to the virtual stage. Fantastic. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you to all of you who are tuning in. We are really excited to, to be able to spend the evening with you. Um, and because of the, the, the wonders of the, the technology world that we live in, which Jane is going to talk about, we get to do this virtually, which is even better. So, so Jane, where, where are you right now? Where, where are you beaming in from? Uh, I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area, California, going to rain tomorrow. So thank goodness we're avoiding a little drought over yeah, here. <laughs> yeah, and I, I am too. I'm actually in Santa Cruz, which is just about an hour and a half south of, of um, San Francisco. And um, I imagine many of our, our uh, people who are watching are probably in Miami or Florida. Congratulations on a good choice. I hear that New York is supposed to be 20 degrees tomorrow because they're getting another new polar vortex. So for all of us who, uh, who made, the, <laughs> made the wise choice to live in sunny places, congratulations. And, and Jean, I have to say, I, so I read your book. I absolutely love it. I thought it was fantastic. And I have so many questions to ask you about it. So, yes. so let me just dive in. And I will say to the audience, you know, so feel free to ask a question anytime. There's this little button that says, ask a question. You don't, you don't have to wait till the end. If you want to ask a question, just hit that button and, um, and I'll, I'll probably read them aloud and, and hopefully we can get a conversation going. Yeah. And don't wait too long to ask a question because we're going only about 40 minutes. Right. So get that question in now. We're going to start Absolutely. answering them in like 20 minutes. So, okay. So, so Jane, you are a game designer, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you make games about the future. Mm -hmm. and, and I have two kids, they love games, but I've never heard them talk about, oh, this is a game about the future. Mm -hmm. So for, for folks who haven't ever played one of your games before, can you tell us a little bit about what they're like? Mm, yes, thank you. That's a great place to start. So while I have worked on more traditional video games, these future forecasting games, they're more like role playing games or even tabletop games that you may have played like Dungeons and Dragons. These are story adventures that you go on with other people, um, but we play them online. So you can go on these adventures to the future, not just with a few people around your kitchen table, but with thousands or 10,000 other people. And instead of going to a you know mystical forest or enchanted world, we go to a scenario 10 years in the future. And we try to imagine 
how we would feel in this future, how we would react, what we would need, what we would want, how we might help others. And, you know, because I do specialize in global challenges and future risks, I mean, we are going to futures that are uh, challenging or difficult. Um, most famously, uh, 10 years ago, I was running s these social simulations of future pandemics and how we might adapt to them. And you play them online in a kind of social network from the future, the game platform. It looks like a Facebook or a Twitter or a Discord, and everybody's sharing photos and videos and stories and news headlines, but it's all imagined news stories. It's all imagined first person reports of of what we might be doing in this future scenario and people stay immersed in these futures for days or even weeks a, a simulation oh. might run for six weeks eight weeks so you get a lot of time to really figure out well hmm, what what would i be worried about in this future yeah. what would i be excited about and and do you find so you guys did did a pandemic one 10 years ago mm -hmm. how how well did it forecast what actually ended up happening like did were, were mm. people able to imagine their way into what we've now lived through? Mm, yes. So it was almost uncanny how accurately ordinary people were able to predict these large scale social consequences that experts did not predict. So oh. if you were to come to one of our pandemic simulations, you know, one of the questions you might be asked to answer is imagine that you've been told by the CDC to quarantine for two weeks or to isolate at home for two weeks. Under what circumstances would you violate this order, not follow these instructions? the number one thing that people said was to go to church or religious services. It was so core to their identity, their values. And of course, we saw all over the world, the super spreader events, all of the original big spreading events were at religious congregations. Yeah. And a lot of the, the social friction that and divisions that happened here in the United States and other Western countries was around the idea of, you know, you can't shut down our our gatherings. We have a First Amendment right to religious worship. And so it was interesting. People knew that that was going to be a real sticking point. People also said, well, I mean, I might have to go out and work. I mean, is the government going to pay me to stay home? If not, then I'm not going to isolate. And, you know, of course, we saw in the real pandemic that countries that actually gave people cash money to stay at home, they had much higher compliance with quarantine and isolation orders. Um, moms who played the game were imagining schools being closed, and they were saying things like, um, hmm, who's going to watch my kids during the day? Maybe I won't be able to work. And of course, in the real pandemic, we saw the mass exodus of women from the workforce when they had to take care of kids when the schools shut down. So all of these ripple effects, social consequences, it turns out that you can pretty accurately anticipate what, you know, expert epidemiologists or public health experts, they might not they might not be thinking quite in the same like sociological way. And we had we had about 8,000 people participating oh. in the one big pandemic simulation. So it doesn't take that many people to get really, you know, important, useful, actionable. And is, what's going on there, is the reason why it's powerful is because of a sort of a wisdom of the crowds type of thing? Mm -hmm. Or is it that, that the experts tend to be so blinded by their expertise that they don't, they do sometimes don't see the common sense approaches that other people will like. Why, why do eight thousand people know something that someone who's trained their entire life for this doesn't? Mm, I love that. I mean, you know, I always say that we are all experts on our own futures, and you know what you would do or how you would respond based on your values, your hopes, your fears, your needs. You can predict that better than an economist or a political scientist, and. It's just not so common for ordinary people to be asked to imagine what they would do yeah. in in these novel crises or these types of disruptions. You know, so so there is the the wisdom of the crowds effect. But I will say the thing that really got me excited about this art form, these the social simulation, even before you know the the real pandemic rolled around, and we saw like wow, 
it's also it's a very accurate forecasting platform. The thing that originally excited me about it was people would emerge from these games seemingly more optimistic for the future. We, we called participants super empowered, hopeful individuals, even though they'd been imagining terrible crises, things you think would make you feel anxious or, or you know, uh, paralyzed, you know, ah, how are we going to handle this? People were coming out of the games feeling ready, feeling like they had a, a better sense of realistic risk and they had a confidence. And when the real, you know, world events matched up our, our simulated games, People who had played them did report feeling less anxiety during the real pandemic, Absolutely. feeling less shock, like they were able to adapt faster. They didn't fight reality. They didn't get into arguments like, oh, is this really going to be serious or not? Is it, do I really have to change my behavior or not? And I think that there was less suffering as a result when you can kind of cut through the normalcy bias faster and just get to the business of being present for the, the crisis that's unfolding, you know, that there's a real benefit to that. So, so there's a personal benefit. It's not just yeah. that we get useful information, right? Absolutely. And, and that brings us to the, to the book, right? Because I think that, that some of those ideas are, are reflected in this and, and, and inspired it. So tell me, at what point were you in this journey when you said, you know what, like what I'm learning here, I, I should put this in a book. Mm, yes. I mean, I, there were two things. One was, you know, by the end of 2020, I think it was about November 2020. Um, I got an email from a collaborator I'd worked with at the World Bank, um, who had worked with me to develop one of these future forecasting games in 2010. And he sent me all these graphics from the game. And, and then he said he sent them alongside photographs from the news. And he was like, everything that was forecast in this game is happening because it wasn't, we were looking at a pandemic, a respiratory pandemic that started in China. We were also looking at extreme historic wildfires on the West coast of the United States. We were looking at a new conspiracy theory group that was spreading rumors about the pandemic online. Uh, the group was called Citizen X in our game and had all these uncanny parallels to QAnon. And he said, you know, what are we going to do about this? What's what's evoke that the game was evoke? Um, he's like, what's the next evoke? What's evoke two going to be about? And um, it did make me kind of want to roll my sleeves back up and get in there. If if we were imagining all the right things ten years ago, that game was played in 2010, looking at the year 2020. You know, what should we be looking at next for 2030 or 2035? And now that we have a track record of these games being both accurate and helpful to individuals, maybe we can get more people participating. Uh, Evoke was 20,000 players. My dream would be to have 20 million people actually imagine the next you know, big global shock, whether it's a mass climate migration or needing to adopt geoengineering efforts to reverse climate change and how we make that decision and deal with unanticipated side effects or consequences of it. Um, hopefully we can scale this up. Well, and what's interesting to me is that the, the thesis of the book is that by imagining things, by by engaging this capacity to to think of alternative realities into the future, um, what sometimes is referred to as counterfactual thinking, right? Because mm -hmm. we can also do it looking backwards. That, that you say there's an actual, this is not, not only a strength, this is a virtue because mm -hmm. it gives us not only the capacity to imagine the future, it helps strengthen us as individuals. It helps, it helps make us, makes us more resilient. So let me ask you this though, because one of the things, and, and you, you mentioned this in the opening of the book, and I wrote it down here that. Since the start of 2020, there's been more than 2.5 million English ling language news stories with the word unimaginable in them and more than 3 million with the word unthinkable. Mm. And, and that seems interesting to me because I can't think of a lot of times when I say like what just happened is unimaginable or unthinkable, except in a, it, at, almost as hyperbole, almost to underscore a point. Mm. But it seems like this language is creeping into our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> think that represents yeah it's funny you know i just recently did a lexus nexus search so of of news stories from around the world for those two words 
And it goes back all the way to like sometime in the 1800s, they've been tracking English language showing up in, in the news. And the, the plot, it looks like an Omicron surge. It's like, oh. nobody's using the word unthinkable. Nobody's using the word unthinkable. And then you get to 2020 and it's like, shoop, and it goes way up shooting up. Um, and I mean, it's, it's truly, uh, I mean, like to understand the times that we live in, the ubiquity of these words. And I think you're right. You know, it, it's not it's not just that we are saying, well, we feel blindsided by the news. I mean, we we're using the word unimaginable to express grief. We, you know, to mean something is it's it's heartbreaking to think about, to try to imagine. We say unthinkable to express anger. You know, but we mean we mean it's unthinkable because it's it's unjust, it's unfair, it's unforgivable. So there's I think there's a sense of trauma really baked Ooh. into these words. It's a combination of collective shock at what is unfolding and also collective trauma. How could we let this happen? Why didn't we do better? Why didn't somebody do better. And um, I, you know, what I, what I hope to accomplish by helping people learn these future imagination techniques is, is for us to not be, I don't know, just kind of like white knuckling our way through the present to the future, dreading the next unthinkable event um, that maybe we can develop a relationship with with change and with uncertainty and with risk that allows us to be realistically optimistic and to find our own power to actually determine which future we get right because it's not just about preparing for risks or threats it's also but about also yeah being, being being amenable to to unexpected things that bring us happiness that might not have thought, thought we might not have thought are going to be part of our life and, yeah. and it occurs to me, I mean, what's interesting is that you as a game designer are someone who lives in a world, I assume, tell me if I'm getting this wrong, lives in a world of imagination, where sort of it, your imagination is your coin and trade. And I think that there's this, this um, bias to think that we live in a time when imagination is easier than before, right? We have all these like Marvel movies and Lord of the Rings, and you can, you can go online, you can pretend to be anyone, right? No one knows you're a dog on the internet. You can play video games. And so, but at the same time, I also think we live in a kind of impoverished period when it yeah. comes to imagination, because we don't have, we don't have religion in the way that they did say a hundred years ago, where there was a real strong belief in supernatural as a part of the day of daily life. We're a very rational society. Even people who are religious, I think, um, treat religion as a, a social dogma mm -hmm. as opposed to a, 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 a way to access a spiritual realm that, mm. that exceeds, you know, the concepts of sort of rationality. We, we live in a world where, where our ties to old myths are much weaker now mm. and where there's just less mystery, right? It used mm. to be that, that, you know, all these things would happen and you had no idea why the, someone got sick and you didn't know if it was because, you know, they did a bad thing in their life or God hated them or a witch came along and put a spell on them. <laughs> now we know why. It's because you got a germ with someone else. And so I do think that, that one of the things I carried away from reading the book was that there is kind of this, this skill set mm. around imagination, around imagine, uh, being able to imagine things that, that I think has in some ways has been strengthened by contemporary times, in some ways has been atrophied. Is that fair? Mm. Oh, I, I I love so much of what you said. I've got, I've now I've got little, I'm filing away things to respond to. So first, you know, I do think the future is in some ways the final realm of imagination. We say at the Institute for the Future that there are no facts about the future. And that's the most wondrous thing about the future, right? We don't know what it is. It can still be anything. You can't be wrong about it. Like if I were to tell you my vision of the future, you could tell me you don't want that future. You could even tell me you don't think it's likely, but you can't tell me that I'm wrong, right? Because we there are no provable facts about the future. So we can still conjure up infinite possibilities, you know, but also at the same time, there, there are lots of images of the future in popular media. And one thing that I really want to do in this book is to help people get away from, you know, I mean, I love the TV series Black Mirror, but that's one set of dystopian stories about the future. And maybe we watch Star Trek and we have a more utopian vision of the future. But 
But we don't want to just consume images of the future, just consume stories of the future. What I try to do in Imaginable is teach people, how do you, how does a professional futurist like me, and, and then you, if you learn the skill set, conjure up your own scenarios so that you can call into existence a world that doesn't exist yet and then look at it and say, you know, is this a future I want to help make? Can I can I build a movement to make this a reality or start a business to make it a reality? So part of the the sort of poverty of imagination that I I do want to help address is allowing people to when we think about the future not just to be replaying popular stories, you know, from a limited set of science fiction narratives, but really to be authors of our own narratives about what the future could be. And, and I want to get into those skills, and in particular, this concept of urgent optimism that, mm. that you coined. Before I do, I did, there's these two questions that came in. Before we get into the hopeful stuff, let's go back to the dystopic stuff really mm. quickly. Because um, because because uh, Paul Regensburg asked, have you gained anything? And I think he means in, in the the scenarios mm -hmm. you're creating. Have you gained anything related to a world in which nuclear weapons have been used or being used, which of course is, mm -hmm. is a, more of a paranoia now than previously, just because of what's going on in Ukraine. And then Nicole Dewey had asked, do you have any favorite games or scenarios in the book? Mm -hmm. So I want to mm -hmm. talk about, about the skills, but before yeah. we get to those, what, what, what would you, like, what are the, what, what should we, we be worried about when it comes to nukes and, and what are the scenarios yeah. that you love in the book? Yeah. So I have not worked on a simulation of post-nuclear attack, but at the Institute for the Future, a colleague of mine worked on some incredible scenarios about novel approaches to nuclear disarmament, which I think is what we all want to imagine, right? We all want to imagine some way to get out of living in, on a planet full of nuclear weapons, but how do we get to that future? And they used some really amazing techniques to come up with possible pathways that are outside the normal conventional techniques. So normally we think about nuclear disarmament as a slow incremental process. And really the only people involved are geopolitical leaders. There's only a few people on the planet really who can take action around this. And there's just that's that's how it happens. But if we rethink those assumptions, one of the scenarios that this group came up with that seems very timely to me now. They came up with this before the pandemic. But the idea was that some independent technology company might invent a technology so miraculous that they could essentially demand that countries disarm before right. they're given access to it. And so they were imagining maybe it's a geoengineering technology, so you could locally reverse the effects of climate change, or maybe a vaccine for some incredible infectious disease. Now, if we imagined a pandemic worse than the one we've lived through that really is, has a higher fatality rate, think about the mRNA vaccines and what a miracle they were in this context. Could we imagine sort of taking this decision out of the incremental, you know, geopolitical process and and just forcing countries' hands and saying, yeah. you want, you want to, you want to, you know, move forward into the future peacefully, happily, safely, like it's time to disarm. And that's, is it realistic? I'm not sure. But what I've heard from individuals in nuclear security who engage with that scenario is that even if that exact scenario doesn't come to pass, it's already, it's sparking a little more creativity, a little more willingness to consider unconventional methods. Well, and what I love about that is that, you know, on the face of it, I think that that seems, that you can identify all the reasons why that would not happen, why that's a terrible idea. But the, but what I found is that so much of, of things that change the world are sophisticated ideas that pe that populations have had time to really acclimate to. You know, for instance, if you take um, the 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 attitude of the Israeli voter towards terrorism mm. is a very very sophisticated attitude, a very complex attitude, because they've lived with it so much longer than, for instance, Americans have. And so as a result, many of the debates that we had right after 9-11 were debates that they had had and had already gone through in Israel. And I think the same thing about the pandemic, that, that there are places, a, particularly China, that have lived through pandemics. Yeah. And as a result, their responses were much more sophisticated. Their population was much more prepared to engage mm -hmm. in a, in a 
complicated, sophisticated conversation around it. And just having these ideas, whether you're right, whether that's the idea that ends up being the one that, that we end up implementing, I think having the conversation and having that process of moral maturity around mm. it, maturation, around having mm. to discuss pluses and minuses, how, you know, what are the cons, the pros and the cons of this, I think is a really, really valuable, a valuable practice, mm, which I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I, so, and that brings us to the second question that you raised um, from the chat from Nicole, you know, what are my favorite scenarios in the book? Um, the very last scenario is about geoengineering decision making, right? Mm -hmm. So what if we need to buy more time and we need to stop extreme heat and droughts and all the extreme weather um, before we can finally, you know, fi be free of, of fossil fuels? It, that it takes time. What if we need a more urgent action? How will we as a planet decide to essentially pull that trigger or push that button? Let's say we, we want to inject sulfate particles into the atmosphere and block some of the sun. Uh, that might have unintended consequences. It might increase flooding risk in certain parts of the world. There's a mental health risk because we've seen in the past with vol volcanic eruptions that had similar mm -hmm. effects. There was mass, you know, depression because people weren't getting as much sunlight as, you know, seasonal affect disorder, but like on steroids. Who's going to decide that we're going to inject these particles? Is it a single nation? Is it a company? Is it a consortium? How do we get informed consent from all of humanity that might have to live through these consequences? I want people to start imagining this now because I don't want us to be starting from scratch. As you're saying, I want it to be a mature conversation so that 10 years from now, when world leaders are saying, it's time we're going to have to take the plunge and give this a shot, even though we're not sure exactly what the consequences will be. It would be nice if we had all spent a little time thinking about it, talking about yeah. it, so that we're not we're not starting from scratch, you know, and really to take advantage of of this, you know, 10 year or longer timeline, that time spaciousness to live with ideas, to let them mature and and form opinions that are not just, you know, I don't know, instinctive or intuitive, but might not actually be that useful or that grounded yeah. in in facts. Yeah. So these, it, it, I think it's all fascinating. And and anyone who, again, if you have any questions, feel free to hit the ask a question a question button. We'll definitely come to them. Okay, so so I brought up this this concept of urgent optimism, mm -hmm. and and you actually coined this term, and I think that you can you can say this is this is not necessarily one of the skills, but but a part of one of the skills that the book says is really important. Tell me about this. Like, what is urgent mm -hmm. optimism? How how should I let it infiltrate my thinking? How does it help <laughs> develop the skills to imagine the future better? Yeah, you should definitely let urgent optimism infiltrate your mind. So, um, you know, I, I do describe it as a mindset that emerges from practicing three different skills or three different psychological strengths. And it's a balanced mindset that combines uh, an awareness of the need to act, right? There are changes we want to make in the world. There are injustices we want to solve, you know, innovations we want to enact, risks we want to prepare for. So having that sense of urgency, that motivation, that focus and drive to make a better future combined with uh, a sense that, you know, there are actions I can take, me, you, all of us, real actions that use our individual skills and abilities, our voices, our strengths, tap into our communities. And, and in that way, we can really affect the future that it's not up to other people, right? Urgent optimism is about finding our own power to shape the future, which is why as you play through the games in the book, I'm asking questions like, well, what are you good at? Or what do you know more about than most people? Or what communities are you a part of that you might be able to mobilize? And really starting to create this, this profile of ourselves as having all of these rich assets that we will bring to any future. And, and by using them today, we can, we can actually change what world we wake up in. And, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's about developing realistic hope, being aware of risks, but being aware of all the new positive policy ideas, technologies, social movements, all the stuff that could make things better. And we're holding these in our mind at the same time. And, and you know, you mentioned a number of games in the book and, and habits that we can mm. use to build urgent optimism, to, to develop that capacity within ourselves. So, okay, so so let's talk about them. So, so what's your favorite? Like what, what, 
What should I, what should I mm. do? Yeah. I mean, what I hear from people who've read the book and the students that I've taught at the Institute and my other classes, their the favorite habit is a game called a hundred ways. Anything could be different in the future. And it's really easy to play. You pick a topic like the future of food or future of learning or future of democracy. And then you make a list of things that are true about it today. And then you rewrite all of those facts so that the opposite is now true. Huh. And you go on a kind of scavenger hunt for clues as to how these upside down futures might come to pass. And I, I use this game with, with all kinds of organizations and communities. Um, a couple months ago, I was doing it with local government leaders in the state of California. So mayors, city managers, um, state legislators. And one of the facts that they wrote down was that there is a minimum voting age in California elections, which is true. Like, right, you have to be 16 or 18 in elections to vote. So they dutifully rewrote that to be the flipped upside down version. There is no minimum voting age. Well, what does that mean? I mean, are we talking about babies voting? That's ridiculous. But what we do is after we come up with this list, we start typing those ridiculous facts into Google search, Google News, Google Scholar to see like, uh, you know, is there is there a signal of change out in the universe that makes it plausible? And lo and behold, there are actually think tanks and policy centers all across the U.S. who are advocating for a minimum voting age of zero. That, in fact, Ooh. babies should be able to vote because they have the most on the line in terms of having to live with the consequences of elections, particularly around climate action or lack of action, and that a true democracy would not disenfranchise teenagers or children or even babies. And then after we come up with these signals, you know, then we talk about, is this exciting or worrisome? And I'll tell you, most of the people in that meeting thought this was kind of an amazing idea and that they would be excited to wake up in a world where there is no minimum voting yeah. age. So it's a very practical habit. You can play it by yourself or with others, but it really helps you just like, unstick your mind. Like, rewrite the assumptions you have about how things are and look for clues as to how they could be different. Well, and what I love about this and, and that example in particular is that, of course, that did happen once before, right? During during the, the 1960s, 1970s, early 1970s, there was this push for to lower the voting age, primarily because of Vietnam and the draft mm -hmm, mm -hmm. came from 21 to 18. And I don't, yeah. I don't think five or six years prior to that, I don't think anyone thought that that, that was a realistic possibility. Mm, well, it, you're conceivable. Yeah. I mean, you're bringing up one of our other, you know, go-to practices for futures thinking is you have to look back at least twice as far as you're looking ahead. And one of the things we look back at is to see previously unthinkable changes that mm. happened. Um, you know, as I think about the future of climate migration, I've been looking back at well, what were what were migration policies like before I was born? Like historically, what have we done about borders and freedom of movement on the earth? And I I I didn't realize how naive I was. I guess I sort of thought of border policy as like a natural law, like the like physics, you know, these are just this is how things are. Of course we stop people from moving freely. And and of course when I look at the history, you know, 100, 150 years ago. Opposite, right. Yeah, you could get if you could get there, you could live there like that. that. That's right. <laughs> that, that was Ellis Island, right? There was yeah. there was no like there was no pre-application, no visa. You just show up and suddenly yes. you become an American citizen. And I think like I'm not saying we need to go back to that, but but it's so useful to realize that the rules we live by are just as arbitrary as the rules of a video game or a board game. We make a decision to play out our lives this way. And if they could be different in the past, they can be different in the future. And, you know, I will say that I think throughout my life, and, and I, I, I'm curious if this is true for you too and for our audience, throughout my life, I've always found that the when people, when I make a mistake or when I see others make mistakes, it's always, it's not because they made uh, the, the the clearly wrong choice. It's not because they they ignored some piece of advice that was, or evidence that was obvious to everyone else. It's because they didn't see the options in front of them. Mm -hmm. They thought that they had two options when in fact they had 10. 
And, and when young people come to me and they say, like, you know, I'm thinking about going into banking or I, I don't know whether they go to law school or become a manager and consultant. And, you know, it seems like and I'm like, there's like literally a thousand other careers you could have. Right. There's but but I think that one of the things that shows the the mark of a of an untrained mind thus far is your inability to see to have that vision, to see mm -hmm. the other options that you're just overlooking and how much it could give you. Um, Absolutely. And I want to, I want to, I want to get back to the book and it actually, so Paul had asked another question, which I think is a great question, particularly given what's going on right now, which is in your, in the book, in your work with the, with, with the Institute for the Future, have you done work on where democracy might, how democracy might evolve in America? Since this is clearly something we are thinking about a lot. And I don't know if you had asked me 10 years ago, I mean, certainly if you'd asked me 10 years ago, could you imagine that Donald Trump would become president? I would have said, that's ridiculous. That was actually a Simpsons episode. It seemed like that was appropriate for a Simpsons episode. And so what has happened in this country and, and across the world when it comes to democracy has actually been almost unthinkable to me, except that that it's happening so in such a widespread way that that it clearly is something that I should have anticipated. What, what have yeah. you guys heard about this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think the most important work that's happening now in terms of forecasting the future of democracy in the United States is just collecting the signals of change to reveal the patterns, right? So as we see voter registration laws becoming more restrictive or the types of misinformation that is blasted on election day to stop people from voting, you know, we can find patterns that suggest the growing risks. Um, I do have a scenario that I've developed that looks at what might happen if we try to put voting on the blockchain. Um, and uh, so, you know, historically on cryptocurrency blockchains, when there's a disagreement in the community about like a transaction, the chain has forked. And then you've got like ha half of the people are continuing this version of the chain and the other half say, well, no, we're on this version. We've renamed it. And this is, we, we accept this version is valid. And they live in these now, these two alternate universes. And we could imagine an election in which instead of contesting it via the Supreme Court, we just fork the chain the way we've seen chains forked in cryptocurrency communities. And you could have some states essentially saying this is how the election results we accept this is our president this is our you know and and the people in another state have the totally opposite reality and trying to figure out how do we how do we resolve this conflict yeah. because we have a new precedent in the blockchain community of people just kind of shrugging their shoulders and saying well we'll just live in alternate realities we'll just right. fork the chain what would it mean to fork the democratic chain. Now, I mean, even if we don't put voting on the blockchain, it's still worth imagining it's an a more, question. a deeper, it's more entrenched, is, yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's refusal to align. You know, what what does it really look like to live in a country where we don't accept election results as a consensus reality? Um, and so, you know, it, and again, I don't have forecasts that tell you exactly what will happen, but I'm trying to raise questions that we could bring more of our creativity and problem solving and urgent imagination to now so that there are more people ready to roll up their sleeves yeah. if, if these so scenarios. We've thought this through before, yeah. before it becomes critical. Mm -hmm. So if, if, if anyone has questions, please send them in. We'd love to take all of your questions. We've got about about five minutes left and and any questions that that anyone watching has we love and and while we're waiting for this to come in Jim, let me ask you this so how does someone become a futurist like tell me a oh. little bit about, <laughs> about your background how did you get to to this place and and i think i'm getting this right you and your sister kelly are twins is that right yes or i have an identical twin yes <laughs> also an author Correct. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So tell me, tell me a little bit. Tell me a little bit about being a twin. Tell me how you became yeah. a futurist and and how did you end up? Where oh you yeah, I got I got stories for you, Charles. That's good. <laughs> um, I will say first of all, being an identical twin is excellent training for being a professional <laughs> futurist because you've got two people born with exactly the same DNA, raised in the same environment, exposed to the same you know, schools and people and environmental conditions, and yet we still have led 
very different lives, right? Um, some things we have in common, but some things we don't. I'm a parent, she's not. Even these little decisions that we make, how completely that transforms our lived reality. It's, 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 it's very good training for looking at, you know, all of the decisions that people are making and societies are making and kind of seeing these sliding door moments, you know, what, yeah. what choices make the future. Um, in terms of how I became a professional futurist, I was actually scouted by the Institute for the Future, um, I, I learned after I joined that many people who become futurists, they are people working in a field, kind of running around with a vision that isn't quite realized yet. And they're urgently trying to create some change or, or bring about some, some novel situation. And I was, you know, back in the early 2000s, doing my grad work at UC Berkeley, I was like, we need to make a different kind of game. We need to bring games closer to reality, really take advantage of the skills gamers are developing to solve real world problems. And the Institute was like, oh, here's somebody who might not just be you know, thinking about the future, she's making the future of games. She's creating a movement, she's creating a field, she's doing research, you know, starting conferences about it. And it turns out like a lot of people who, become very good at anticipating the future, it's just because they're they're making it, right? You know the Alan Kay saying the best way to predict the future is to invent it. Um, and that that actually is is true. People who have their own vision for what they want the future to be and are trying to establish the the policy foundation or invent the technology or do the research or build the social movement to make it real, um, those are actually like that's the fast track to becoming a futurist is, is actually true. trying to make the future. <laughs> and do you, and, and this is the question that um, occurs to me as a parent, since you're a parent hey, and, and your kids, are they teenagers or? No, the seven-year-old twins. Yeah. Seven -year -old so, twins. Okay. So, um, so early days. <laughs> what's, your, what's your attitude towards video games and screens? Mm -hmm. Oh yes. You know, it's so funny. Just today I allowed them to install their own version of Neko Atsune on their own Chromebooks. So my philosophy for gaming with my kids, first of all, is we play the game together on my device first and okay. we, um, we kind of explore the challenges and, you know, is, is this a game? I, we say there's like junk food games and there's like nutritious games, like eating yeah. vegetables. For me, games that are nutritious are games that really are requiring a lot of problem solving or creativity. It's not, you know, just grinding and, and uh, collecting and things like that. So, um, so we have that philosophy around games and uh, they have to do an hour of physical activity for every hour that they wanna play on their tablet or their Chromebook. I mean, we have limits, but I love playing with my kids and I love asking them, you know, what's, what's the hardest thing you've accomplished in this game? Or like, what are you working on now? What's your goal? What is it gonna take to achieve it? What have you gotten better at since you started playing this game? So that I can celebrate and reflect back to yeah. them the real skills and strengths that they're building as they play. That's really nice. Okay, By so the oh, go I, I, speaking of, of games and online games, I did want to also share with folks who've joined us today that the Institute for the Future has actually opened our first online center for social simulation where anyone oh. from the public can join and participate in a monthly scenario club where we play with different scenarios. Um, we're going to do twice a year social simulations. This year we're doing climate migration and geoengineering decisions. And uh, and also, you know, teaching, I'm teaching, we're hanging out, we're doing signals of change scavenger hunts. And so if people are like, how do I actually play these games? Where do I find them? Um, you can come to Urgent Optimists plural because we're all hanging out together.org and it's our it's the institute's first public membership program where anybody can just come and play and and build their future thinking skills that's fantastic so we're almost out of time so let me just ask one other question which is if there's one thing that you hope people carry away from this book one big idea that they that they turn to their spouse you know before they fall asleep and say you got to hear this this is this is important what is that idea? I mean, the, the big idea of the book is that the future is a place where literally anything can be different and that the most important mental habit that we can 
cultivate is always looking for clues or evidence that literally anything could change, even things that have been true for decades, all our lives throughout evolutionary history, and that if we can expose ourselves to alternative possibilities, or we can play games that help us conjure up possibilities that we've never imagined before, that holding that potential for change in our minds. You know, that's where hope comes from. It's where creativity comes from. It's where motivation to change and capacity to change comes from. And we can drive the change, not just, you know, sort of live through it, right? We can become the creators of that change. And that's that's the mental habit I want people to walk away from. Just look, always be looking to challenge your assumptions and find those signals of change so that we can we can have that power to make the future that we want. I think it is so important and it is, it is a habit. It is a skill that we have to develop and we have to work on. We have to strengthen that muscle just to mm -hmm. see the possibilities around us because there is someone else who will see them and they will seize them and they will shape them. If, if we are con stuck in that, uh, the consistent consistency, if the consistency is the hobgoblin of little mind, <laughs> yes. we want to get out of that trap and see the, yes. the broader fight, world. fight the normalcy bias. That's what we <laughs> want to do. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Shane. This has been such a fascinating conversation. Anyone who uh, is interested, you should absolutely buy the book. Um, and thank you to all of you for joining us today. And thank you to um, Books and Books and to all of the indie booksellers who helped mm -hmm. sponsor this and make this happen. Uh, it's because of booksellers like you that the world is a better place. You are saving democracy. So thank you for doing it. And, um, and I'll turn it over to our host. Thank you both so much for this conversation and thank you everyone who joined. And I just want to give a quick reminder that you can buy your copy of Imaginable from Books and Books in our stores online or from any of our other indie bookstore friends that sponsored this event. Just press the screen button or go to anyone's website. And thank you both for speaking tonight and thank you everyone who joined. I hope everyone has a great rest of their night. Thank you, everyone. Take care. <laughs>